welcome back. My name is Margaret Rose. And I'm the vice chair of the HDS Alumni Alumni Council. It worked. I'm really pleased to introduce somebody who, of course, needs no introduction in this place, the incredible Professor Harvey Cox. Our session today is called Whatever Happened to Secularization? Harvey Cox, Jr. is the Hollis Professor of Divinity Emeritus. He began teaching in 1965, both at HDS and in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. An American Baptist minister, he was the Protestant chaplain at Temple University and the director of religious activities at Oberlin College an ecumenical fraternal worker in Berlin and a professor at Andover Newton Theological School. His research and teaching interests focus on the interaction of religion, culture, and politics, that you all know. He explores urbanization, theological developments in world Christianity, Jewish-Christian relations, and the current spiritual movements in the global setting, particularly Pentecostalism. Professor Cox was previously a visiting professor at Brandeis, the Seminario Bautista de Mexico, and the Naropa Institute, and the University of Michigan. The most recent books are How to Read the Bible, and Lamentations, and the Song of Songs, a theological commentary on the Bible. The Secular City was published in 1965 and became an international best Seller. It was selected by the University of Marburg as one of the most influential books of Protestant theology in the 20th century. There are many other books that you no doubt know about. He's going to tell us about some of them, and we look forward to hearing him now. Though I have to say one thing of my own time at Harvard Divinity School, besides taking a wonderful class in which he asked me to do some translation for which I was completely incompetent at, he also played at my wedding. <laughs> the Embraceables. So, the Embraceable Harvey Cox. Well, thank you so much, Margaret. I remember that wedding. It was a great event. And welcome to all of you for the 200th. As I, as I look out across this uh, group of former students here, I see a few who still owe me term papers. <laughs> you know who you are. And maybe you can close the page by handing in those oh, greatly overdue term papers. And I'm. I guarantee you that I will read and enjoy them, as I always do reading student newspapers, news, uh, term papers. So uh, inevitably, for me, talking about the topic of secularization, where it came from, what it is, what happened to it, has to be a little bit autobiographical. Uh, the book that Margaret Rose referred to, Secular City, published in 1965, I originally titled God in the Secular City. I wanted to assure readers that just because something was becoming secular, that is no longer under ecclesial control or definition, I didn't mean that God was not present. That God, in the biblical perspective, is present in all of history, in nature, in in political movements, in individuals, and it is for us to discern the presence of God, which is not confined to religious and ecclesial institutions. However, the editor said to me, God in the secular city, no, 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 no. Let's just call it secular city, which is what happened. That was the title. So I brought along today something that I haven't handled for very, very many years. I decided it might be kind of fun to show some of you. And this might appear to be a little braggartly, 
Some of the original translations, this book was translated eventually into 17 languages, some of which I had never heard of, the languages I had never heard of. So we have La Cité Seculaire, French, Stadt ohne Gott, Fragezeichen, from the Germans, Die Stadt von Mensch, I think that's Dutch, but I can't be sure. The Stad van de Mens. Now, I don't know what that is, but it's, it's, a, uh, it's a foreign language that I can't read. Well, I, I won't go on. But however, I think one might say that I bore, therefore, the curse of an early success. Yeah, the book was very widely read, very widely circulated. And uh, the trouble was that <laughs> editors and others kept thinking that I should write one that would be equally successful. And for 50 years, I tried to do that. I ne never did succeed. <laughs> Still trying, but never quite made it to that. So the question, however, that I wanted to pose to all of you and to myself on this anniversary occasion, what about this whole question of secularization? How did it start? How did it, why did it become such a big deal? Why was there so much commentary on it? And what's happened since? And I have to say that um, the year that I spent that Margaret Rose just referred to, that wonderful year in Berlin, 1963-64, after I'd finished my doctorate here and went and worked in Berlin in the church in that divided city with a wall running right down the middle. I was assigned to work with some church groups in East Berlin. So I went through Checkpoint Charlie probably more times than anybody you'll ever meet. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> and came back, by the way. And, uh, and I was, I was uh, greatly inspired and instructed by the uh, Christians in, in the East who were not, do, not committed to overthrowing the uh, communist regime there, but how to live within this new society that was emerging and to bear their witness there and not jump over the wall and come back to the, to the West. Uh, they didn't particularly favor people who made that move. It was a wonderful year for me. And it was especially important because that was the year that I really discovered the life and theology of another former Berlin resident, namely Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I soaked up Bonhoeffer's writings, including the letters and papers from prison, which some of you have read, I'm sure, in some courses that I've given and uh, began to see the world a little bit through Bonhoeffer's perspective. Now remember that in the last year of his life, Bonhoeffer was arrested and imprisoned, actually for two years he was in prison, the last year of his life. He was uh, relatively sure, in fact quite sure, uh, that the, uh, he was never going to get out, that he was, he was going to be executed by the Nazis. He had a chance to get out at one point, and refused it because he was, he was afraid it would endanger some of the other prisoners. And he wrote some letters to his friend Eberhard Betke, which were collected in that wonderful volume, Letters and Papers from Prison. And in one of those letters, which uh, had made a big mark on me, and which is quoted in the Secular City, he says something like this. We are proceeding toward a time of no religion at all. How do we speak of God without religion? How do we speak in a secular fashion of God? Speak in a secular fashion of God. Well, in a way, the whole book that I wrote, the whole Secular City book, was an attempt to answer Bonhoeffer's question. Now, however, what has happened in the intervening years, there have been some, a number of intervening years, 50-some years, is uh, people have said, no, Bonhoeffer was really wrong. Eventually, Bonhoeffer, by the way, was killed by the Gestapo. He had involved himself in the plot to assassinate Hitler. He was found out. Uh, and just, just before the Americans closed in on the concentration camp where he was being held, he was uh, hanged. Uh, that was in uh, April of 1945. People said, no, look, 
he thought we were approaching a time of no religion at all. How could anybody be so mistaken? Look what happened all around the world, all these predictions about the decline and marginalization of religion that people were making, some very wise people were, including members of the Harvard faculty back 50 years ago, were saying, no, nah, religion and modernization, that is a zero-sum game. The more modernization you have, the less religion you have. The more religion, the less modernization. So we're on the road to modernization, <coughs> and religion will be more and more marginal, uh, and we'll have to, there will be patches of it here and there, of course, but it'll, uh, it will not. It will ha it's time, the time when religions could enter into the public arena, could form cultures, could inform political movements, is over. Now that was wrong. And one of the things that happened during my brief career here at Harvard Divinity School is that some of, perhaps all, or almost all, of the most significant spiritual leaders and spokespeople of the 20th century were people who made their mark in the secular, political, cultural sphere, especially in the political sphere, but not, not completely. Think of, think, of the, think of the great, the titanic figures in the history of religion in the 20th century. Gandhi, whose spiritual insights derive from the Bhagavad Gita and the Sermon on the Mount, as he says, uh, really sparked and led the revolution that ended the British Raj in India. Or uh, think of Martin Luther King Jr. When people, uh, certain, certain people at least thought that the, the black church was not a significant political or social factor, they were wrong. They hadn't read the history of the black church in America. But Martin Luther King made his mark, a spiritual mark, a religious theological mark, mainly in the public arena. There was uh, Bonhoeffer himself. Uh, one of my favorites is, of course, uh, Dorothy Day, the founder of the, of the Catholic Worker Movement. I'll never forget the picture when I first saw it in the New York Times of this old lady sitting down as she was supporting the farm workers in their strike out in California and eventually being sitting in, <coughs> being dragged away by police was her witness. <laughs> Think of Malcolm X, who uh, also <laughs> made his mark in the, in the uh, political social arena, uh, drawing, in his instance, on the uh, Muslim faith. So we have <laughs> Catholic, Protestant, Hindu, Muslim. <laughs> what was happening in the 20th century was not as it turned out, the decline, marginalization of religion, but religion assuming a role in the public sphere that people had really not expected. Now, look, when that happens, it's good news and bad news. When religion begins to shape the public realm. Remember that among other things, I am a student and it's still an admirer of a teacher that I had when I was at the school, namely Paul Tillich. Paul Tillich, for all of his vast accomplishments in theology, and there were many, was the guy who brought back into theological discourse the category of the demonic, the demonic. He was greatly criticized for that. Seemed a little superstitious, a little weird. But he had lived through the First World War and the coming of Nazism to Germany. He knew that uh, evil in the world was not just something in isolated individuals. There were evil demonic forces, uh, in, in either un unconscious or subconscious or in some way social, uh, that had to be dealt with. And I think that has to be said also about religion. If there is a revival of religion, which there seems to have been, rather than the disappearance of religion in the last decades, 
look out. I've studied religion long enough to know it's good news and it's bad news when you have a religious revival. You can produce a Martin Luther King, a Malcolm X, a, a, a Gandhi, but you can also uh, uh, produce and motivate uh, people to hate and to divide. You can spark enmity with the powerful, powerful force that religion uh, supplies. So, as it were, the game has changed from the game uh, that was going on, at least as it was being described, when the secular city first appeared. We're not dealing, we are not dealing with the disappearance and trivialization, marginalization of religion. We're not dealing with that. We're dealing, uh, as one of my friends used to say, not with the death of God, but with the rebirth of gods and goddesses and sprites and spirits and spooks. All of this is coming back and is making its impact for good or for evil, and often uh, for both, uh, on, our, on our lives and on our society. So it's a different theological task uh, than I tried to put my mind to 50-some uh, years ago. In fact, I wanted to hold up one book here that uh, nobody knows about. That I, this is a book uh, which is a collection of, of uh, conversations I had with a, a very insightful Buddhist theologian, Daisuke Ikeda, which we were, were recorded and published in this book. The book is called The Persistence of Religion. Now that's a little different, isn't it, than the secular city? The persistence. The question is, why has religion persisted? And what does it mean for us that religion is, is, has persisted? How do we deal with that as uh, theologians and theological students? So I want to take a little pause, in fact, because I have a, 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 a sort of sore throat today to rest my throat and to hear from a few of you with a couple of questions that I want to pose. Be careful not to blow my nose because I have a mic right here. It's going to resonate through the entire building here, entire tent. <laughs> um, I'm going to pose a couple questions. Think about it for a moment. And if you have something that you'd like to say that would be useful. Uh, first of all, let me ask uh, well, a couple of these questions. And you can pick the one you want. What do you think happened in the last 50 years? We've been talking about the last 200 years. I haven't been here for the whole 200 years, believe me. I've been here for the last 50 some. Uh, what happened such that Bonhoeffer's prediction and many other people's predictions about the marginalization of religion <laughs> didn't happen? In the Islamic world, in the Buddhist world, did not happen. Uh, something quite different happened, a kind of a renaissance, a revival. Of, of religious movements for bane and for blessing. Why? Why did that happen? Why did so many thoughtful people misjudge uh, the arc of, of history? Why did that happen? Uh, that's one question. Another question I'd like to put to you, and it's related to that one, is uh, uh, if in fact we are dealing with a plurality, a conflictual plurality of different religious movements and impulses. How does that shape the work of the theologian, the minister, the student of religion? How does that, what, what difference does that make? When I was a theological student, we, we, we kept seeing books like Religion and the Modern Mind, as often the modern man, modern man, uh, who was taken to be technical, uh, uh, rational, all, uh, and we had to retranslate the gospel <laughs> in order to reach that kind of mentality. I don't think we think that way anymore. It's really not, uh, uh, not, what, uh, not what we're doing. But how, first of all, why did this happen in the last 50 years, and how does that change our calling? as theologians, as ministers, and those who work in the field of religion. I'm going to give you about two or three minutes to talk to somebody close to you. Uh, and I'm going to send out <coughs> the, the mic runners. And please, 
um, uh, respond to that. So either one of those questions or both of them. Go ahead. So uh, order, please. So if, you'll, um, if you have some response you'd like to make, and I sure hope you do, put your hand up. Here's, a, here's somebody right here, Mike Runner. Hello. Hey, everybody. Um, you'll get a chance in a minute. Uh, so one source um, is the women's spirituality movement which brought in goddesses. Right. And I remember at the very beginning of that going to a, uh, a group in Austin, Texas at the Unitarian Church uh, that was very humanistic. And we, were, we started a, a little evening program talking about goddesses. And somebody said, hey, wait a minute. We're Unitarians. We believe in one God at most. <laughs> but women have discovered not only the concept of the female divine, in many, many different manifestations, but in also brought us into a kind of cross-cultural look mm -hmm. at how the divine and female form exists in many, many different cultures, some ancient and past, but often being revived today. I'm currently part of a ritual group. I mean, you, you minister, but I'm, and sometimes these happen in churches, but also part of another ritual group that learns about and relates those goddesses to women and what women need to do in the world. Mm -hmm. Women hold up half the sky. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I'm glad you, you brought that up because I, I, in my view, I was here at Harvard Divinity School just as the, uh, the, the women's studies program was being birthed. And people like Emily Culpepper, does everybody here remember Emily Culpepper? One of my favorite students, the only student in the entire history of my teaching here to whom I gave an A plus. Because she and a cohort of her, of her fellow women took over my course one time. They were smart enough not to take over an administrative building. Who needs them? They took over a course with my kind of quiet uh, agreement. And they taught it for about a week and a half and did a fantastic job and brought up readings from f feminist sources and all the rest. And I think even, uh, so I was here when all that was happening, and I'm enormously grateful for it, in part because the impact of the women's movement in theology and religion and church life is in, was enormously larger, I think, than even those original women anticipated, because it uncovered a lot of the uh, spirituality, the divine, if you will, in the, in the secular or in the allegedly secular, and brought it to the surface in a way that can never be um, denied again. There it is. So I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, and uh, and I, there was a great program here, was it yesterday or the day before, on the uh, history of, uh, of the feminist movement here. Uh, those of you who remember Emily Culpepper will remember she used to walk around the corridors of Harvard Divinity School in her Superman suit. Uh, to, to attract attention uh, to the women's cause. Uh, now, Emily was a fairly small woman, and the Superman suit was a little bit too big for her. So the arms would sometimes flap. Uh, but she, she was a kind of a feminist gorilla. She knew what, uh, uh, what gorilla theater could get across. I'm, of all the, of all, all the students, well, there are many, many students I'm grateful for, well, I'm exceptionally grateful for Emily. Other comments? The, is this working? Yes. The statistics I read show that in this country, as well as in the rest of the world, participation in organized religious institutions continues to shrink. In this country, theological schools are closing down right and left. Now, the most familiar phrase as a minister I encounter is, oh, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. All right. All right. Want to comment on that? Sure. I think you're, you're right statistically in, in some respects, but not entirely uh, correct. If you look at Europe, the, the uh, measurable elements of religion there 
church attendance and all that seem to be going down. But if you look at other parts of the world, look at China. After 50, 40, 50 years of uh, atheist rule, there's a religious revival going on in China. Traditional Chinese religions and Christianity. Christianity is growing very, very rapidly in China. And there are predictions that within the next 30 or 40 years, it could well be that the, one of the largest, if not the largest, Christian community in the whole world will be uh, in China. Or look at uh, Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, where you have thriving uh, religious movements, many of them charismatic or Pentecostal or mixtures of indigenous African religions and Pentecostal and other uh, uh, charismatic expressions. Now, this, this leads me to make, uh, uh, answer my own question in a way about the decline and alleged decline and marginalization of religion. In my view, that was a very Eurocentric reading of world history. It was, an, it was imposing or projecting on the whole world something that was indeed happening in Europe the decline of the power of institutional religion for various historical reasons that I could go into, not what was happening in South America, where you had the liberation theology movement, not what was happening in uh, Africa or, or Southeast Asia. Uh, we went through a period about 20 years ago, a certain point at which the, the majority of Christians in the world no longer lived in Europe and North America where you continue to have either stable or somewhat declining populations while they're growing uh, rapidly elsewhere, especially uh, forms of Christianity that, uh, that uh, were viewed at least as somewhat marginal in this country, the Pentecostal and Glossolalic religions. So here's how I illustrate that to myself. When I was a, a doctoral student here, one of the key words we liked to throw around was the word demythologization. And we especially liked it in the German form, entmythologisierung. What was the thesis? The thesis was we, we have our message, the gospel message in a mythological language. We no longer understand and relate to mythological uh, language. Therefore, it has to be translated. It has to be demythologized. R uh, Rudolf Bultmann and many others worked on that. Then, not too much later, when I started becoming very fascinated and involved with uh, Latin American liberation theology, and I taught, as my introducer said, for two years, two different years, at the Seminario in uh, Mexico City, uh, the, phrase, <laughs> the phrase they liked was not demythologization. It was a phrase in, in, in uh, Brazilian Portuguese. And I'm going to say that, too. Desnortification. The denorthification, the denorthification of theology. What those folks were saying in Latin America and Africa and other places was what we've inherited is a northern Eurocentric view of Christianity, the Bible, the gospel, Jesus Christ, and all the rest. And it's, it, we have to denorthify it in order for it to uh, be uh, uh, valuable uh, in, our, in our setting. Okay, let's take one other question if we could, if there's one out there. Yeah, right here. Yeah, did, did Cornell whisper that into your ear? We worked on it. Okay, all right. <laughs> I'm very quick. It was unfair because you answered the first question before I got a stab at it. Uh, but I was going to say that secularization is the exception, and, and I think you described it. For the second mm -hmm. one, I would say that uh, someone who is biblical will understand that diversity is in service to unity, and mm -hmm. therefore we're very much interested in the pluralistic. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Well, let me take the next step here, because <coughs> I have a few more. Oh, oh yeah, wait. Let's, let's hear this let's hear guy. If we don't let him have the mic, he's going to jump up and down and yell and scream. And... No, I'm not. <laughs> uh, I, I would like to personally mention Harvey as, as 
I was in your first class back in 1965, and I am crushed to know that you gave an A-plus to somebody in your career. But, <laughs> well, but, but what I... You mean somebody we, and it wasn't you, right? It, it, th that is true. That is true. Uh, <clears throat> but over here, we were talking about the fact that, uh, at least in America, you know, religion, according to Pew, is not on the rise. But what is on the rise is the involvement yeah. of religion in politics in uh, ways that uh, are both, as you mentioned, constructive and uh, seemingly somewhat less, th less so. What do you think about the role of religion in politics mm -hmm. today and what could religion do going forward if there's going to be a continued role in politics for religion to the better? in our country? Yeah, good question. Now, I mentioned all those figures whose uh, main impact, spiritual impact, if you will, was in the political and social realm. Now, look what we have, however. Something that I had never anticipated. A liberation theology, a liberation theologian who is the pope. I, I mean, my fondest prayers would not have expected that. Now, he doesn't like to use the word uh, liberation theology. Uh, be, be clear about that. He doesn't want to do that. But when, everything in his agenda, almost everything, there's a very important exception that I'll get to in a moment, uh, has to do with the church exists for the excluded, the brokenhearted, the people pushed to the periphery. This is what the church exists for. A church which is open to the world, which is serving the world. And it's, it's this guy from, um, uh, from Argentina. Remember, Francis is the first pope since 411, long time in there, who wasn't, is not a European. Every single pope has been a European, one kind or another. We've had a whole flock of Poles and Germans and Italians recently, always Europeans. He's a, uh, he's a man from this, uh, the world of the South, from South America. He's a Brazilian. And furthermore, why, whereas every pope since the second century, when, uh, when assuming the uh, responsibility of the papacy, took the name of a previous pope, usually, until they get up to something like Gregory the 14th or John the 23rd or, 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 or Ignatius the 86th. I don't think he ever reached that. This is a guy who broke that chain, the first one. Now, most people haven't read much into that. I read an enormous amount into that. What a choice. He took, he took the name Francis, Francis of Assisi. And by that, he's, he is really saying to himself and to you and to all of us, here is what my agenda is going to be. To be with the poor, to be with the brokenhearted, with the lepers, with the outcasts, to comfort them, to support them. That's what I'm going to do. And remember, as soon as he became pope, one of the, his, his first trip out of Rome, when he became pope, was down to the island of Lampedusa in, in the Mediterranean, where bodies were washing ashore of people from Africa who were trying to escape hunger and uh, despair. And he said mass right there on that little island on a boat that had capsized with some of these uh, folks drowning them. And he, and he faced Europe and said, these are our brothers and sisters. We have to receive them, welcome them with open arms. Now, that's a countercultural statement uh, given the uh, current sentiment in a lot of Europe which is not particularly welcoming uh, of these uh, needy folks. So I think something important and structural has changed there. <coughs> uh, and uh, I find it extremely encouraging. In fact, uh, I decided I was so interested in Francis uh, that um, I, well, I, should, I should brag here a little bit that I met him last November when I was in Rome. I made arrangements and I met Francis and you can even go, you can go, you can go on the website of, uh, of my, and, uh, Harvard Divinity School and see me meeting him. It was a great thrilling moment for me. Uh, by the way, uh, the day before I met him, the 
person who, inter who had arranged the uh, audience said to me, Harvey, how can I put this? The Pope really doesn't understand English. How's your Spanish? I said, well, I haven't used it for, but it's, I'll try. He said, well, however weak it's, it's better than the Holy Father's English. So when I met him, we started speaking in Spanish. He'd been a little sober, and he immediately lit up. And if I could put a little balloon over its head, he would say, thank God, one gringo who knows the, knows the language that I can understand. We had a nice long talk about various things, the things he's reading. Uh, we discovered that we both have the same favorite movie, uh, which is uh, Fellini's uh, La Strada. Uh, we talked about that and talked about a number of things. But the main thing I wanted to convey to him was that there are a lot of people in this world, and they're not all Catholics or even Christians, who see him as a sign of hope in a time when there isn't a whole lot of signs of hope around. So he, uh, <coughs> as we were leaving, he was holding my hand. He said, would you pray for me? I said, of course, we'll pray for him. So I, the, next, the next week at our little local Baptist church here, Old Cambridge Baptist Church, I asked them to put Pope Francis on the list of people we pray for every week. And he's there. So about, uh, about three months ago, somebody came in to visit this Baptist church and came rushing up to me afterwards and said, is this a Baptist church? I said, well, yes, it is. And you're praying for the Pope? I said, you better believe it we're praying for the Pope. And I hope you are too, whatever uh, church you're in. You see, there are signs, not only in the world out there, but in, even in the crusty old ecclesial institutions, that there's a possibility of, uh, of breakthrough, new life, new breath. Uh, and uh, a lot of it is coming uh, from the southern world, from Africa, South America, and, and, and the Asian Rim, and eventually China. There's going to be a Chinese pope one of these days. Uh, the Chinese have taken over everything else. Why not the papacy? They'll be there, and I think we we'll, could be in pretty good, pretty good hands. So I'm coming close to a conclusion here. Uh, and let me put it this way. Secularization, whatever happened to it? Maybe it never really existed. Maybe it was a kind of, a, of an illusion. Uh, a, a distorted vision of those of us who were focused too much on the culture and religion of the Eurocentric world. And we saw a, a religious institutional decline, certainly was there, attendance at church and all that, but we didn't look around the world and see an enormous vitalization of religious movements, again, for good and for evil, all around the world, which is exactly what was, uh, what was happening. We needed a desnortification of the, of the uh, theological enterprise. I've also come to believe, this is my really final remark, that uh, instead of talking about the uh, secularization which has been really not, in the long run, the most productive category to talk about these things. I'm beginning to think in terms, I'm trying to think of the right word, the dispersal, the dispersal of the sacred. Not its decline, its dispersal into various institutional, political, cultural movements. Uh, again, for, for blessing and for bane. Uh, the sacred is not any longer the monopoly of religious institutions. It's out there, everywhere. And it can appear in distorted form, in misleading form, or it can appear frequently in uh, pristine and beautiful form. So our, our job, as I think, as theologians, is to see where it's happening, see where it's emerging, sort out the wheat from the chaff uh, and affirm what, uh, as I said in the secular city, what God is doing in the world, in the world, and not just through religious institutions. Let me close by a, a fond memory I have. 
which actually echoes what I've just said. Uh, when uh, my, my, I had been working in Southern, at the Southern Christian Leadership Conference with Dr. King in the 1960s, from about 1964 on. Uh, he, got, <coughs> he got me arrested twice. I never had the honor of being in the same jail with Martin Luther King. I kind of resent that. Uh, he was arrested 22 times, I was told. Me only, uh, only twice. Uh, but he called me one time, I think it was about 1967. And uh, he said, uh, I want you to speak at the annual meeting of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was the organization he had organized. Uh, we're going to meet in Birmingham. I said, Birmingham? <laughs> Not a very friendly thing. He said, well, you know, they've, now we've passed the open, uh, open fair occupancy laws and things like that. And we're going to go back to Birmingham. I said, well, why do you want me to speak? He said, well, we still have this problem, Harvey. He said, there are a lot of people in the churches, our churches, black churches, white churches, who don't think being out there in the streets demonstrating and marching and is really appropriate for church people to be doing. I couldn't believe that, coming from King. I said, well, isn't that what the whole thing is about? He said, well, there are an awful lot of people that we have to persuade that that is a relevant and appropriate thing for church people to be doing. And I'd like you to talk about that. So I, <clears throat> I went down to Birmingham and uh, was introduced by Dr. King. And somewhere in my files, I have a picture of Dr. King uh, introducing me. And uh, the title of my talk was, What is God's Business? What is God's Business? My answer was, the world is God's business. <laughs> What's happening in the world? The movement of the world toward uh, the kingdom of God. That is God's business. And we are engaged, called as church people, to be involved in that work. Our work is, is in the world too, uh, where, where, where God is initially at work. So anyway, here we are. Uh, 50 years, 200 years, 50 years of, 52 years of my being around Harvard Divinity School, 200 years of Harvard Divinity School having been here. It's an enormous thrill to see all of you here. And do remember, if you still have a term paper that's due, <coughs> I won't grade it down just because it's a little late, 20, 30 years late, that's okay. Uh, uh, do hand it in. Uh, uh, you can send it to me. I still have a mailbox here. And, uh, and uh, thank you all very much for being here.